you go down to the woods today, you're sure of a big surprise. If you go down to the woods today, you better go in disguise. For every bear that ever there was is gathered there for certain because today's the day the teddy bears have their pick. Nick. <laughs> Well, maybe I can get started with um, welcoming everybody for to tonight's event. Um, this event is part of the Once Upon a Time in Animation exhibition at Pool Museum. And we're extremely honored to have um, two speakers tonight, the founder of the NCCA, Professor Peter Kaminos, and the project lead on the Once Upon a Time in Animation exhibition and principal academic at the NCCA, Dr. Eike Falk Anderson. And yeah. With that, I will hand over to Eike. Yes, thank you, Oliver. So, yes, hello, I'm Eike Anderson. I am a principal academic at the National Center for Computer Animation, uh, where I first started as an undergraduate student, now 23 years ago. Afterwards, I uh, did my PhD there, then worked for a few years um, uh, elsewhere before returning to the NCCA in 2012, where I've been since then. Peter? Hi, I'm Peter Cornelius. I used to be a professor at Bournemouth University. My background is in uh, computer, uh, computer science and uh, specialized, when I got my PhD, specialized in computer animation. I originally started uh, teaching at Teesside Polytechnic up in the north of England. Um, and then a few years later, I think six years later, I moved uh, down south to Bournemouth, which was then um, an institute of higher education together with Peter Hardy, who's the other person that we started the NCCA together. Um, okay, that, that's enough of me. <laughs> so um, Peter, um, perhaps just for the audience, can we just let's say what is 3D computer animation and what makes it different from other animation forms? Okay, so to start with, let's categorize animation into two different categories, traditional animation and computer animation. Traditional animation involves traditional techniques like drawing, painting, um, play, uh, clay uh, or object animation and computer animation obviously involves the use of computers. Again, we can categorize animation in two different categories, 2D and 3D. In 2D animation, uh, it, which is usually drawn or painted, the artist interprets the three-dimensional world uh, through and produces a perspectively correct uh, image. In computer animation, uh, it's not so much it's not so much the artist, but it's a piece of software that the artist uses in order to model, light, and view the world. So, how did computer animation get established in the United Kingdom then? Well, in the United uh, the development of computer animation in the United Kingdom was quite different from the development in the States. In the States, uh, animation primarily started at uni in universities and it was initially funded by the Department of Defense. So most of the people who did animation at the beginning in the States were computer scientists rather than artists. In the UK, it started the other way around. It was artists who were primarily working for advertising agencies or television production companies that started experimenting with a computer. Now, because these guys were artists, they had to learn a little bit of about the mathematics and programming before they could actually uh, produce any animation. Uh, oh. Most of the, sorry. So how were these early computer animations then created? Right. Uh, some of the early animations, well, all of the early animations, uh, 3D animations, were produced using proprietary software 
th that a lot of the time was bespoke for a particular animation sequence. So although they had met perhaps um, a library of routines which they would use repeatedly with different animations, they had to write a computer program to implement an actual animation. So it was pretty primitive at the beginning. Interesting. So, I mean, if we look at 3D computer animation and what we now know about animation systems, we find, I think, that there are really three capabilities that they all have to possess. So first, there is the model generation or the input of the model, which means we describe or in some other way obtain the scene and all the objects in it um, that we want to animate. Then uh, the second capability is the animation or the model manipulation. So where we describe the frame by frame movement or transformation um, and lighting conditions for the given sequence of the animation, where we don't have to actually do every single frame nowadays, uh, but just um, say uh, specific keyframes and then can leave the computer to figure out all of the steps in between. And then finally, there is the model visualization and um, uh, display generation. So where the computer then takes the scene description provided by the artist or designer, and then um, translates this or calculates it for every single frame of animation and then does the actual drawing onto some form of output device that then allows these individual images to be recorded as a sequence. And obviously, as you said, at the um, end of the 1980s when the NCCA started, there were no commercial off-the-shelf computer animation systems. Yeah, can I say, can I add something to this? Can you return to the previous slide? Yeah. Okay, for the for the naive listener who doesn't understand much about computer animation, let us say that what the artist has to do is individually design every character and every object that will appear in his or her animation. Uh, and then he has to light the scene with artif with an artificial light source, which is imaginary, it's, in, it's stored inside the computer. How strong, what color, how, what distance from the object. And then shoot the scene with an imaginary camera, which only exists inside the computer, and it interprets the three-dimensional world that was created in order to produce this animation. Okay, now you go to the next slide. Yes. No, I mean, yes, then again, it's a completely virtual world that doesn't exist in um, uh, reality, uh, which then also has the benefit that we can do things in computer animations that are not possible in reality. Yeah, it's also, if you want to relate it to something physical, it's the closest thing we have to puppet animation in traditional animation. In puppet animation, the animator, as you've, uh, as you've seen in the previous slide, uh, will move an object, take a picture, move the object, take a picture. And when you play that back in real time, you see a real uh, a real time movement. So yeah. time in animation is quantized, it's not continuous. And it's really a case of creating something from nothing because when you exactly. start with it, it is completely an empty slate. It's, you know, the universe before the Big Bang uh, and then everything in it has to be first created before it can be moved. Yeah. So, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> so where were we? So we are at the end of the 80s when you started the NCCA, um, there were no commercial off the shelf computer animation systems. So how did you solve this? Yeah, well, I started uh, doing, uh, as I said at the introduction, I did my PhD in computer animation, which was at its very beginning at the time, um, in the 1970s. And um, I wanted to do computer animation and I couldn't get my hands on a piece of software that would actually do that. So I had to invent it from scratch. Uh, I did a number of experiments and after a while, I um, finalized the design, if you want, for a new language, uh, scripting language, 
which will allow me to tell a computer how to animate objects, how to build objects, how to light objects, and how to view objects. Uh, so this was a system which I did for my PhD initially called uh, Seagull, Computer Animation, uh, sorry, Computer Graphics and Animation Language. And it looked very similar to a programming language called Pascal, but it had a lot of extensions. You can see some of the, um, a script which actually creates an animation sequence on the right of your screen. Um, and it, it was quite sophisticated in that you could achieve quite a bit doing that, uh, instructing the computer how to um, produce the animation sequence. So the computer will go through these instructions step by step and will actually produce the animation frame by frame, record it on disk, and then we'll, we'll have an, it will allow you to play back what was recorded on disk in real time. Now, depending on how powerful the computer was, it would take a few seconds or a few hours, and depending how complex the, the animation was. At the time when I started, we had very weak computers compared to what we have today. Uh, probably my watch has more, or my phone that definitely has a lot more processing power than we had available. At the time, a typical speed of a computer that we would have in a university would be one million instructions per second, which is laughable nowadays. Where yes. these were integer instructions per second, where now we're counting um, millions of floating point instructions per second on a modern computer. And plus, we don't have one uh, central processing unit, one CPU. We have six, eight, 32, um, 120, 64. 64 is the highest we have on uh, computers that you can buy as an individual. So, and every one of those CPUs can run two processors. So <laughs> you get an enormous amount of processing power now compared to what we had then. So shall we look at what was possible with Seagull? Okay. You need to go to the next slide. Yeah. This, by the way, is the very first computer animation, one of the very first computer animations that were done at the That was before the NCCA was created. Yeah, so the first animation created at the NCC, oh, actually at Bournemouth before the NCCA. 
Yeah, it was. Uh, the, the Bournemouth at the time when Peter Hardy and I joined the department, well, the division then of computer um, graphics and animation, I think it was called, um, had one of the degrees they had was a video pr a production degree. And the video production degree had an option in it where the students could choose to do a project in computer animation. Um, so, but that was, you know, not a lot of teaching in the area. And basically what the students were taught was primarily how to use the software. Before Peter and I arrived, uh, they were using another system. I can't remember the name of it now, um, which was uh, a lot less sophisticated. It was basically wireframe animation that they were looking at. So as you can see from this first animation, you can see that Seagull already had textures, multiple light sources, uh, a way to do procedural animation. Um, you had articulated structures. Uh, in other words, there was a hierarchy of objects that you could connect together to create that particular bird. Um, many light sources, 3D textures, which was state of the art at the time. Yep, and no shadows. No shadows, yes. Yeah. Okay, so, so what then led you to uh, the point of actually setting up the NCCA? Well, Looking at what was happening at the time in education, with a few notable exceptions, which would be, I suppose, Middlesex, uh, Teesside, and Bournemouth, very few universities, if any, had any courses that dealt with computer animation as such. There were some places where artists were allowed to use computers if they wanted to in an experimental fashion, but nothing related to uh, 3D computer animation, if you will. And we decided, Peter and I decided that 3D was what we were interested in. And the reason for that's quite simple in that 2D computer generated animation has a lot of unsolved problems, which have, has, haven't been solved yet because it relates to a 2D animator creates the perspective him or herself, while the computer has to create a perspective using incomplete information. The computer would only work from two-dimensional pictures and it would try to infer the three-dimensional shape of the world from the two-dimensional projections, which is quite difficult, quite a difficult problem to do. It requires a lot of AI, which didn't exist at the time. Um, so, because there weren't any people produce any, any universities uh, teaching computer animation, there was very few individuals that were able to work in industry. And by the late 90s, industry started growing. Uh, sorry, by the late 80s, the industry started growing and required more and more individuals. So by looking at what was the supply, and what was the demand from industry, we decided that what we needed to do is somehow speed up the process of creating computer animations, uh, animators. So rather than by accident, somebody stumbling into 3D computer animation, we were going to design courses and we were going to do research which related to the topic of how we form a 3D animator. Now, a lot of this was basically, um, came out of the collaboration that Peter Hardy, which you see in the picture on the top, and myself at the bottom, you see both of us together uh, at the bottom, came from two different disciplines. I was a computer scientist who was um, aching to be a filmmaker. And he was an artist who was aching to use computers to produce his pictures. So we realized pretty quickly that you need the amalgam of those two disciplines computer science and mathematics, and also art in order to form um, computer animation. So it will be a blend of uh, the courses we were going to create, if you want, will be interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary and blending the practices of art and the practices of science. Okay, so um, the 
art and design or computer science courses on their own would not have been sufficient then, yes? Computer science uh, courses on their own wouldn't be because uh, in order to write software for an artist, you've got to understand what motivates the artist and what the requirements of the artist are. If uh, you let a computer scientist design something without talking to an artist, they will produce something, they produce a tool that only a computer scientist would use at best, not an artist. So you need to, a close collaboration between uh, art and science. Uh, so you either need to have a multidisciplinary team that works on, um, on the subject or on creating a movie, let's say, or you would need somebody who is aware of both art and science and be able to combine them. Now, there were certain institutions in the States, like at the New York uh, um, Institute of Technology, which was a small private college that decided to put arts and scientists, arts and sciences together. And uh, Ed Catmull, who is of Pixar fame, uh, run the team there for a few years. So that was uh, beginning of the 80s, I think. I'm oh, sorry, uh, sorry, the end of the 80s, yes, I think. Um, actually, Catmull, I think, was there st uh, until the early 80s before he, I think, went to what then became Pixar. Yeah, uh, it was initially moved to um, the what later became ILM, and then it ILM split into 3D and animation and the animation side. When Catmull and various other colleagues joined Lucasfilms, they were primarily working on hardware that will allow the creation of uh, digital effects. And when they moved on their own and became Pixar, uh, well, Pixar initially started producing hardware and then they wrote some software to show how their hardware would work. And that's how the Pixar system started. And how, that's how Renderman eventually became Renderman. So, uh, and, yeah. yeah. And so um, trying to blend this art and the science, you then, I think, with industry um, support, then set up the NCCA at Bournemouth. Yeah. Well, we... I'm sorry. You go ahead. No, please. You were there. Do you know you more. To, yes, do, please. Do you want me to pick that up? Yeah. Okay. Uh, be, because uh, are we doing the? All right. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, well, at the end of the eighties, um, as exactly 1987, Peter Hardy and I moved from Teesside to Bournemouth and we started uh, on the design of a master's course which will actually embed, if you want, art and science together and will give us our ideal course for postgraduate course. At the time nobody was doing that. Uh, Middlesex had an art degree a master's degree in which you could use computers. So you could specialize in computers, art, if you want, but it was a specific 3D animation. That's, that's what Peter Hardy and I wanted to do. That's probably one of the reasons why we left this side is because they wouldn't let us do that. Peter Hardy was working in the Department of Design. I was working in the Department of Computer Science and they were fighting among themselves, who's gonna own the course? And eventually nobody did, <laughs> we left. Um, so we came down to Bournemouth to actually do that. By 1989, in the autumn of 1989, we thought, why don't we just talk to industry and see what these guys want, see what their requirements are for us to try to implement courses in that area. So we instigated a series of meetings which took place in London in various production houses. And in the last meeting, uh, a committee of people who were there called themselves the Establishment Board of the NCCA. And they just got, very quickly uh, decided that the only way universities can actually produce the people that they needed 
was to have a center of excellence in computer animation. And they looked around and we were the most likely candidates to succeed. So they said, okay, we'll give you the title of National Center for Computer Animation for four years initially. So that's how the idea of the NCCA started. And the idea of the NCCA was to create undergraduate, postgraduate courses for the teaching of computer animation in order to accelerate the production of graduates, which will work in industry in London, which at the time was beginning to require more and more graduates. Um, remember, at the beginning of the 80s, these companies were very small, there were five or six people each, and most of them have disappeared. Uh, there's only, I think, moving picture company that still remains from the originals. Um, and uh, the second thing we we're going to do is we're going to do research to advance the stage of computer animation in the UK. So that's basically the idea of the National Centre. Yes. Now, when we got the permission to call ourselves the National Centre and start running a master's course in computer animation, we had to convince the management of the university that uh, to fund this because at the time computers which were required in order to teach those students were in the region of 12 to 11,000 pounds each. And that's for a one MIP machine, very, very, very small machine, well, very weak machine compared to what we have today. Because remember with one million instructions, not only you had to run the program, you had to produce the graphics as well. Um, and so the university agreed to start a course with 12 students. Uh, we managed to convince um, various hardware manufacturers to make donations. The biggest donation was done by Hewlett Packard, well, Apollo Computers, which eventually was uh, jo joined Hewlett Packard or Hewlett Packard bought Apollo Computers. So they supported that. So it they made a huge donation for the opening of the center. Uh, we got a very powerful computer as well as the workstations to actually do the rendering uh, of the animations. And the Under Secretary of State um, came down to inaugurate the National Center, if you want. And that's the idea of the National Center. That's how it started. And here we are on slide eight, three decades uh, later. So, yeah, that lets. Let us see, you know, with it, I actually, well, with your help, dug up a video from shortly after then. In only three years from being an educational institute, we have become the leading new university. We are both high tech and highly motivated, eagerly researching the knowledge that will drive the 21st century. Nowhere is our forward march more apparent than in computer animation and visualization a firmly established course making great strides and with close industrial links. Computer animation and visualization is led by Professor Peter Komnenos. If it's closer to the eye than the projection plane is, what you get is that it becomes bigger. Right. Students here have won the National Computer Animation Student of the Year Award every year since its inception. First prizes at the London Film Festival, London Film Week, Animation Week and Biographics. Work has been exhibited in Japan. Sponsored teams here have won so many prizes that their headquarters, the Apollo Center, has become the British National Center for Computer Animation with an international reputation. We do welcome foreign students because they bring a different perspective to computer animation which gives us a unique style which we find very helpful. I asked Professor Peter Komnenos about his experience working with the Japanese. As you know, the software that I write for animation is used also for visualization purposes by a number of uh, construction companies in Japan uh, who use it for visualizing things like uh, mine restoration, uh, uh, golf course design and landscape design. Mine restoration? That's right, yeah. It, you know, when a mining company has finished with a particular mine, they usually have to fill it up and make it look uh, uh, similar to the surrounding terrain. So they use the software for visualizing what they're going to do before they actually start doing it and moving the earth. Clearly, computer-simulated movement has unexpected industrial applications. 
Students sponsored by our partners would readily be accepted for entry on the course. There would be guaranteed places for agreed members. So you then uh, established the first courses. Yeah. Um, well, the first uh, dedicated course um, was um, a master's course, which involved um, the recruitment was primarily people from an arts background, but we didn't exclude the possibility that technical people could also join the course. For instance, in the first year we ran the course, we had a uh, nuclear physicist who decided to do a master's in computer animation and he eventually uh, ended up, he, he, can you see the picture at the bottom where the, uh, the uh, no, the, the one on the, oh. yeah, the second one, yeah. Okay, that, that was done by a guy who had a degree in nuclear physics. Uh, <laughs> and the only artwork he had when he came to do his interview was some drawings on his, um, on his surfboard. So he brought his surfboard along with, with the drawings he had on them. And Peter Hardy and I interviewed him and we gave him a place. Uh, so initially we designed a course for 12 students. Very quickly, we were inundated. So we ended up running the course for 20 students, which created problems with the hardware. And we had to go back to um, Apollo computers and ask for help. Now, Apollo computers were very helpful. Um, they were so helpful that the VAT people um, actually did a, a, um, an inspection on them because they thought they were fiddling their books. They've donated uh, close to 800,000 pounds of equipment to us in order to run our courses. And they were even more generous than that. They established a chair in computer animation, which was called the Apollo chair. And I was the recipient of the chair. So I was called the Apollo professor of computer animation to the amusement of a lot of my colleagues. <laughs> so Seagull, uh, the Seagull system was used um, for, for creating animations or also for industrial purposes. One thing we haven't mentioned is that um, there was a British company that dealt with road design which actually bought the rights to use Seagull with their system, together with their system, to, so that uh, road engineers could um, visualize uh, the, what the road would look like after they finish it, and they would sell it to the public in uh, public inquiries, etc. So it was used for that as well. But I think you mainly meant for creating entertainment education um, um, yes animations yeah so uh, yeah and obviously um, uh, some of the work with um, seagull was then also used for commercial animation production yes uh, the, the the university had a subsidiary company uh, which was set up by us basically uh, called the cupboard and the cupboard was basically either Peter Hardy and um, a number of ex-students and uh, demonstrators that worked in producing uh, commercial work. Their work primarily was in the, the region of uh, entertainment simulators. So the um, one of the films that produced, we just see the third picture from the, the left to the right, yeah, that one, um, was the flight um, in Mars, flight simulation in Mars, and they did that for the Astronaut Hall of Fame in um, Florida. Uh, it was quite successful. I don't, uh, we do have an animation of it somewhere, but if uh, we don't have enough time to go through all the animations mm. that were produced. Yeah, and then there was this you know, incredible suckers. Yes, incredible suckers. Uh, do you want to pause it for a second? I'll say a couple of words. Uh, yeah. Oh, I think you removed the sound, right? Yes. So, so we can can over it, over it, yes. yes. Okay. Uh, well, incredible strikers. Uh, uh, there is a giant squid called Architeuthus, and uh, the scientists were aware of it, 
because they either found it dead on a beach or they found bits of Architeuthis in the stomach of uh, whales, of sperm whales. And for years they've tried to film uh, and they knew there were fights between uh, Architeuthis and sperm whales because they could see markings, uh, sucker markings on the, on the skin of uh, sperm whales. Uh, and uh, they tried to film a, a fight of that sort for years and they couldn't. Eventually the ship that they, uh, uh, that, uh, they were using for, for doing this filming uh, sunk. So they decided to come to Bournemouth University and see if we could produce um, a, a, an animated sequence which will depict the fight between a squid and a, and a well. And um, that was Oxford Scientific, which was the producer of the documentary, which was shown on Channel 4. Now, they use Seagull for producing this. Uh, Ari, uh, no, sorry, uh, Vasili, which was one of our ex-graduates and then became member of staff, and Jackie rather um, worked on this piece. I had to actually modify the software for that, because as you can see there, the whale and the squid change shape over the animation. And if you texture something with a 3D texture and then you change the shape of it, then the texture will slide over the skin of the object. And we wanted the, the texture to stay still, stretch and deform together with the body of the, of the animal. So I had to produce um, uh, textures which were not uh, which were locked if you want to the object. So that's required quite a bit of modification of the software. So yeah, it was produced uh, using Seagull and it was shown on channel four. Right? Yeah. So that then gets us to, I think the end of uh, the first decade. Yeah. So, which is, yeah, around when I joined first in 1990, um, uh, 98, so just before then. Right. Um, and, yeah, so this is, I think, the, the way that the course kind of looked like when I joined. So a bit of, you know, um, evolution of one decade, but this is how the undergraduate degree, I think, uh, ended up. So we had these three streams. So yeah. technical units, which had the maths and the programming, then some art units, which had, um, you know, also some uh, art history and art theory um, in them, and then production units, which put those two together. How do you rearrange the pictures of the people uh, so that you don't cover the diagram. Um, I'm not more to speak in... I think um, uh, I think you are in floating controls. You can make it smaller. There are buttons at the top where you can make it. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because you wanted me to talk about the actual uh, structure of it. Yes. Yeah. Discuss the diagram. Okay, so strictly speaking, year one, year two, year three of the degree, uh, the blue part of the diagram are the technical um, technical subjects. The green are the production subjects, and on the other side you have the, the yellow are the art units. So what you get in effect is you get an amalgam of technical and creative subjects. And in the middle, you have the mixing of the two, which are primarily used in the, produ in the production of animation. So not only do the, does the student have to understand the technical side of the animation and the creative side of the animation, but has to be able to apply it in order to produce animations as well. So the input requirement in, uh, yeah, for, for this course was we required a student to have an A-level in a creative subject like art, um, a, a technical A-level. So that could be 
maths or computing or something of physics, something technical to show that they have some ability with uh, mathematics. And a third, their third A level could be anything. So we started recruiting people in 92. And I remember discussing uh, the structure of the course and the input re um, requirements with the Pro Vice Chancellor of Education of the university. And he said to me, there's no way you're going to get any students that have an A-level in art and an A-level in maths or, or programming. And I said, well, let's see. <laughs> so we started running the course with 20 students. And the, after a few years, the demand was such that we had to double the number of students on the course. They were getting so many applications. I remember the second year we were on the course, we got 4,000 applications for 20. Is it 20 or 24? I don't remember anymore. I think it 24. might have been 24. 24, right. So when we doubled it, that went to 48. So the second year we run the course, the first year we run it, it was validated very late. It was validated at the end of, um, at the beginning of August. So we only had a month and a bit to uh, recruit students. So, but still we managed to get 24 reasonable students. <laughs> the second time around, we had to double the number, well, not the second year of running, but a few years later, we had to double the number of students. It was so popular. Of course, we couldn't afford, ideally we needed to have one student per machine, but we, at the time the university couldn't afford it. So we ended up with 12 workstations for the first year and two students had to uh, take alternative uh, goes on the computer. So one student will um, go away and do his or her homework and the other student will work on the computer and then vice versa. So they would share, two students will share one computer. But there were practical classes in which all the students will attend and they will uh, sometimes they will even share the keyboard, uh, but take turns on the keyboard. So yeah, basically it was the amalgam of creativity and technical ability. And a lot of our graduates started getting jobs straight ahead in industry. And so our reputation grew gradually from that yeah. point on. And then, okay. you know, towards the end of the 90s, we also see that there was actually a lot of developments that had happened in uh, the industry as well. So one could say, you know, it had come off age. We had the first, um, you know, feature animation films, more and more visual effects in films. And then uh, I remember around that time, uh, you know, it's like 3D uh, accelerator cards before they had, um, uh, graphics cards that could do uh, all of 2D and 3D. So I get add-on cards that would allow you to do 3D, uh, 3D real-time graphics on um, home computers came in. So that, that was quite a, a large jump in also the computing capability. Yeah. So uh, at, at, at the same time, oh, I think, sorry, yeah, I mean, at the same time, I think when uh, just, uh, a year after I joined, we also switched from Seagull to uh, Maya, which was uh, really uh, one of the first off-the-shelf um, high-level um, computer animation yeah. systems. Yeah. Well, Maya actually was the development of the alias uh, system uh, before Maya, the same company, had produced a, a 3D system which was not really that sophisticated. It's uh, Seagull could wipe the floor with it when, uh, in the eighties. <laughs> but Maya was obviously a great investment. The, the, it required um, thousands of man hours to produce. And it was a, a system which was designed specifically for industry. So it was impossible at that stage to compete for Seagull, which was a man, one man show to compete with um, uh, the, the alias software, which was Maya. Um, it wasn't feasible. 
Yeah, so what were the implications of switches? Naya? Well, for, for teaching, the implications were that uh, all of a sudden you have to pay um, alias a lot of money for licensing the software because the software using the model that they were using in industry where every workstation will get a license. So you'd had to pay X amount of money for each workstation. And then you had to pay for expensive workstation, which at the time was around 13,000 pounds for a single workstation for the small silicon graphics machines, which were tiny purple box about that size kind of thing. Yeah. I, I, I remember at some point health and safety, um, uh, you know, it's like from the university complaining about toasters in some of the classrooms. And those were actually the O2 uh, machines. <laughs> yeah. And they were uh, very easy to steal because they were very small. So it had um, a lot of implications switching from homegrown software to commercial software. The other, the biggest disadvantage is cost. All of a sudden you have to pay for, the so for your software and you have to pay for much more expensive hardware as well. Because by that time, the Hewlett Packard machines became a lot cheaper compared to the silicon graphics. Mm -hmm. But then a few years later, silicon graphics stopped making workstations and we switched to PCs and um, Maya and other commercial software was running on, on very high end PCs. Yeah, I, I remember. Uh, well, and around that decade, so, you know, 1999 to 2009, I remember there were quite a few um, student animations that also went to SIGGRAPH. Now perhaps yeah. I can explain SIGGRAPH to uh, the audience. So it's the world's most important uh, annual conference in computer graphics. Uh, and uh, uh, usually when there isn't a pandemic around, it attracts between 30,000 and 40,000 delegates every year. And this is where the latest scientific, technical and artistic breakthroughs are published and also presented to the public. So Pixar tends to premiere their short films uh, there. And it has also the so-called electronic theater. So a presentation of the best and most important computer animations produced in any one year. And quite a few of our student work ended up there as well as the animation theater, which is slightly wider. So we can have a look at some of these animations. Well, one thing you should mention is that uh, getting a, a, an animation piece on the electronic theater is like uh, being uh, a finalist in the Oscars because it's very, very hard to get an animation in there. They're usually um, two, three thousand animations entering the competition and they select about 24 or something like yes, that. Yes, it's usually 24. And yes, it's actually quite a lot of the short animated uh, films in the electronic uh, theater are also um, on the Oscars shortlist. Right. Okay, so you're gonna show some of these. Great.
but for the benefit of our audience, this looks a little bit hand drawn. Uh, can you explain some of the techniques that I used in the production of this animation? Yeah, I mean, that was John Haddon, who was uh, in the same year as me when I did The Bachelors. And yeah, so he actually, to get this pencil or ink-like appearance, um, um, had to write a lot of um, custom, um, quick go back, so custom um, uh, code for rendering and image processing. So bleeding ink out in, in water outside the lines, which he did with some cellular automata, and then some additional tonal mapping to emulate uh, the effect of you know, pastel colors being applied to paper. So that's so, something, a, sub, a process that's applied after the animation is produced by the computer. Yes. And so then, then it's post-processed. by and for, then compositing things together. Yeah, and then composite the two things together, yeah. Okay, I hope that makes sense for our, our audience. quite sweet. Um, so uh, I think that uh, Ian McKinnon who did this was one of your students who you supervised. Yeah and again you can see the same sort of a similar technique used in this project compared with the previous one. Uh, if you look at the animation sometimes the, there are things which appear like glitches like um, this is not a fault. There's a lot of that is done on purpose. At the time, there was a trend among young computer animators that we're going to make a computer animated film look as though it was produced by hand. Uh, it was almost a, a reaction against the glossy, super shiny objects that, that 3D computer animation was known for. Um, and it, it was it was an interesting trend, which eventually uh, burned itself out. And I think uh, it, it's uh, it's something you can use for arty films. It'll be very difficult to do that for a computer, uh, for a commercial computer animation and sell it to the general public, you know, for doing a, a Disney Studios uh, film for kids. You could do it, but it's a lot of additional extra work which you have to do once you finish the, the computer finishes rendering the scene so it's a lot more difficult to make a film like that than a 
a traditional 3D animation. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Let's see what else. This one doesn't have any sound. Um, that was created by uh, Ben Tugood, who is actually yeah. in the very first court of students that I taught when um, I, well, I was doing my PhD. Yeah. And you can see that has a totally different style. It tries to produce uh, characters which look realistic. So if you wanted to specialize, let's say, in digital vi uh, visual effects, which uh, would seamlessly blend real objects like you have in this uh, film with computer generated objects, then you would go for photorealistic uh, rendering of the imaginary objects of the, yeah. of the objects that the computer renders as opposed to the furniture, which is it looks as though it's a real, a three-dimensional object that. Yes. I don't know if it's true or not. Yeah, it is. And yeah, yeah so that's Ben Trugut, who I think now is actually a head of 3D computer animation at Ardman. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay, we've seen that. Can you get to the next one? Yep. When you turn a corner and you smell death, it's not your imagination. It's zombies. In Bethnal Green, they scavenge out of dustbins and skulk along the shadows of the tube station like wounded hyenas. In Hackney, you might see them standing motionless behind the town hall, but they're more afraid of you than you are of them. For all their gruesome appearance, they only want to be left alone. But a mile down Mare Street in Leighton, we are definitely on the menu. They are not afraid of bright lights and their greatest weapon is the fact that most people treat them like big spiders, thinking that while they may look frightening, they're harmless. Mistake. You're a long way from Hackney, you might yell as a zombie shuffles away from you. Then you can say goodbye to your brain. They're organised in Leighton. They hunt in packs because they've realised they can't take a man down alone. While fear is their greatest weapon, arousing terror in your prey only gets you so far. You can't chase a healthy man with dead legs, nor wrestle him to the ground with dead arms, but a pack of zombies coming at him from all sides will be successful six times out of ten. Women and children are their main targets. The smaller and weaker they are, the better. A zombie's second worst enemy is other zombies. Food is scarce with the enforced curfew, and night watch is run by people like me. One stray child's brain doesn't go far to feed a pack of starving zombies, and fights over food are a common occurrence. There are many casualties. Occasionally you might see limbs discarded at the side of the road. Of course there are no deaths, which brings me to the zombie's number one enemy, me. There are two ways to stop a zombie. Set fire to it, or cut off its head. If you can do both, that's better. Zombies have been known to continue wandering the streets without their heads, but this is an exception, and a sightless zombie doesn't pose any real threat to civilians. While the authorities are doing all they can to eradicate the infestation of the living dead in the East End, the problem seems to have escalated in the last few weeks, and everyone is advised to be extremely vigilant not to be confused with vigilante, mobs of which have sprung up in Walthamstow and Chingford. I suggest everyone in the East End stay in groups and stay alert. If you can't do that, stay at home. Stay at home is very, very uh, <laughs> current. Um, anyway, so... was a great success at SIGGRAPH. They got a, a, a lot of um, praise at SIGGRAPH. As it said, you know, okay. electronic theater, you know, it's like, you know, one of the 24 best animations of the year. Yep. And yes, that was Damien Hook, who is, I think, now creative director of short form at Blue Zoo. Yep. Yeah. It, 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 Blue Zoo was created by a group of uh, students 
uh, ex Bournemouth uh, animation students, undergraduate students, who uh, at the time they asked my advice, uh, they wanted to set up an animation house. And I said, well, have you got rich parents? <laughs> I was um, I was wrong, of course. They managed to set up their company and it became quite successful. Yes. So let's see what they I only come out and yeah. yeah. The next one, do you know what the title of this is? Theros, which stands for two things in Greek, uh, summer and the harvest. So I suppose the harvest is the title of this. So. And it's actually quite a distinctive style that uh, I've seen in some of the works that he has created um, since graduating. And he's actually now also an um, uh, internationally exhibited sculptor. Um, and I think what's made this quite interesting is that there is a lot of procedural animation in this. Let's say a little bit about procedural animation. What, what a procedure is, is a recipe. So what the artist does in this case is creates a recipe and then the computer is asked to apply this recipe. So if, uh, for instance, you have a thousand birds flying, all you have to do is describe how a, a, a bird flies, a single bird, and then with a little bit of randomness, the computer can make a thousand birds fly slightly out of sync so that they don't look synchronized if you want. So that's what procedural animation is. And it's the most powerful form of animation. Um, the, the idea of a procedure can be applied both to animation and to model making as well. Uh, because if let's say you had to populate a terrain with a thousand trees of three different categories, or three different types of tree, rather than the artist having to create every tree individually, you create a procedure, you create a recipe which tells the computer how to build a tree, and then you let the computer, with a little bit of randomness, apply the same uh, recipe a thousand times. Okay, so and that's what procedural animation, yep. uh, or procedural modeling in the case of the trees.
So that was by Ben Jones, and it almost didn't make it into uh, also the exhibition where it's shown uh, because there were concerns uh, at the um, uh, council uh, that there was too much fat shaming going on. But I remember we had too much fat shaming. Right. Okay. Uh, so, but uh, I remember actually it being very successful and well received at SIGGRAPH in San Diego when we were actually there when it was shown. Uh, yeah, and, um, uh, to be honest with you, I don't really recall it. Well, I recall it being shown, but I don't remember any controversy, at least in the electronic theatre. Oh no, there was no controversy at SIGGRAPH. It's here at the town council. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Right. So that's the question of uh, British political correctness. Yes. Yeah. But let's you know, moving away from the student work. So, what about the research? So, okay, how did so, the NCCA research develop over time? Okay. So, let, let's start with uh, when we uh, first set up the NCCA. I said that one of the uh, reasons for being for the NCCA was to create and promote research and computer and 3D computer animation. Now to, um, to do research and to promote research, um, you actually need a lot of money. So um, it originally started with just me doing, doing research. Eventually, um, after a while, managed to get a bit of money to, to start employing more researchers. Now, Let's say a little bit something about the research assessment exercise, which is the mechanism by which we got additional money for doing research. Uh, the research assessment exercise was basically an exercise that was run by uh, the um, educational, um, the Department of Education, uh, of higher education, sorry. Uh, which would evaluate periodically um, the F research efforts of each university department and it would grade a university department by giving it a grade between one, which means more or less uh, give up or try harder, uh, to five star, which means um, you're doing very well, you have an international reputation. and an amount of money would accompany that assessment. So when we first, first time we did the, uh, uh, took part as a university, as a new university in this exercise was in 92. And we got a four out of five uh, with just one person, me. Uh, then I used the money that we got from uh, this uh, for, for our success in the RAE uh, to employ more, more and more people. So we employed uh, John Vince, who was another professor, and then subsequently uh, um, uh, Zhang Zhang, who, who eventually became a professor when he originally started, he was a researcher. And next RAE, uh, we entered, um, which was four years later. We entered uh, three people, uh, Zhang, John, and myself, and we got a four. And then that, because there was a multiplier, of the, the amount of money was multiplied by the number of people you entered. Uh, so we got three times as much money. We started employing more and more researchers, and these researchers became uh, more specialized. In the next assessment exercise, which took part, part, place in 2001, we got a five star, which was the gold standard, if you want, international reputation in research in 2008. Then eventually they changed. Uh, so our research started progressing and getting better and better ever since. Um, the NCCA had three research groups. Um, and um, one was run by um, Professor Zhang. Uh, the second was run by Peter Hardy, a creative research uh, center. And one was run by me and Alexander Pasco and uh, Valeri Asjev, 
initially were in that group and then uh, Oleg joined us and then uh, obviously Ike was with us and um, various other people joined later on. So the, the pictures you see on the um, yes. right hand side of the diagram there, they, this is basically the research of Alexander Pasco Valeri um, and um, um, Oleg a little bit. And then uh, we had Dennis, who was a PhD student, I think, as well. Yes, and uh, yes, we have a PhD student who, who did some of the work. And this is totally different from other types of modeling. Basically, what we're doing here is we're modeling objects by describing the shape in three dimensions, not as a set of polygons, but as a set of mathematical functions, which when visualized, create the shape of this object. And what you can see that the girl sticking a hand in the, in the soft mirror, and then when she pulls her hand out, the, the material of the mirror sticks to her hand. And there's, you can almost imagine a sound going <laughs> as she pulls her hand out of the mirror. Uh, so it's very good for doing soft objects, that sort of modeling. And also one of the difficult things in computer animation is uh, shape transformation, which is very popular with traditional 2D animators. They can change one shape into another shape, a bird into a book or, or something like that. Now in 3D, it's very difficult to do that, to interpolate between two different shapes. So to go from this shape to that shape, it's very difficult to do it if the way you describe those shapes are through polygons of the skin of the object. But using this technique, the actual model is created by a set of functions which describe the density of the material of, uh, that create this object. So it's easy to interpolate between functions. Well, it's easy, easier. It's not easy. Nothing's easy in life. It's easier to interpolate between those functions so that you get from this object to that object gradually. And, have something that makes sense in 3D. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and that, I think that takes us to the end of the second decade, and which is about the time when I briefly left uh, Bournemouth for four years. Uh, so um, I returned in 2012. But this is also, I think, yep, yeah, shows. Um, the majority of the, I think, teaching staff at the time. Yes, uh, some ex-teaching staff and some current teaching staff there. In the middle, you see uh, Peter Hardy had left by that point. Uh, you see me with a towel around me. I don't know who I represent, Washington, George I think. Washington. George Washington <laughs> and behind me. the Delaware. Yeah, and behind me is Steve Bell, who was the... Um, Steve Bell is an artist computer at artists that joined the NCCA um, as we were about to start teaching the first masters. Uh, so he wasn't, he wasn't so much involved with the design of the masters, he was involved with the delivery of the masters, and then he was quite heavily involved with the design of the first bachelor's degree, which, uh, which, create, which combined art and science. And this degree took a year to design a lot of dis heated discussions because uh, despite the fact that we're all friends, um, artists and scientists have a lot of things which they disagree on. <laughs> Peter Hardy and I used to give common talks in, um, to, to people in industry and they, they used to laugh and love us because we actually disagreed live on stage. I would say something and he would contradict it and vice versa. And in the end, we got our, our nickname was the, the, the Peter Twins, because I'm Peter, he's two, Peter. So it's like a person with two heads disagreeing with each other, if you want. Okay, <laughs> take us to the next slide, please. Yeah, that's uh, then around the time, so like, you know, when uh, that single undergraduate degree suddenly multiplied and became three undergraduate degrees. Yeah, okay. So the basic design there was that if you look at computer animation, 3D computer animation, 
in the production of it in a production company. On the one hand, you have techie people, R&D people who actually write the software or improve the software because even though most of the time they use off the shelf software, they have to write extra bits of software which will improve what the standard software can do. Obviously, this is their competitive advantage. That's how they get the job, as opposed to the other company down the road, which uses exactly the same software. So on the one hand, and you have the R&D people. On the other hand, you have the plain artists, the, the artists which are not so much at um, au fait with technology. Uh, they are the artists that end up doing some of the um, grunt work in digital effects. For instance, they would um, um, work on particular frames individually, or they would rotoscope uh, a motion, etc. So they will be doing the, the grunt artwork, and these guys here are doing the grunt code work. They write the software primarily. So somewhere in the middle between those guys the R&D scientists and the art, pure artists, you have the computerate artists, you have the person who is good both at technology and art. And these people usually are called uh, technical directors and they specialize, they have technical directors in camera work, technical directors in motion capture, technical directors in lighting, etc. So the, these normally would be the interface between the R&D people and the artists, which are not so computer. -y. So they end up being the problem solvers, if you want, the lubricant between the technology and the art. So what we've done is we divided what's required, what knowledge is required for these three categories of people into columns. The very first column is the hard-nosed maths and programming side, which um, computer scientists would need to know. But um, the uh, second column is, uh, that's the theoretical science stuff, that's the practical science stuff, and that's the application in the middle, it's the application of the um, technical stuff for production. If you go the other way around, you have, you start with theoretical art, applied art, and again, you have the application of art, in the field of 3D animation. Uh, those purple boxes there represent the fact that we can't really, we want to teach the artists a little bit of math so that they have an appreciation of what math can do. But we can't share this maths with the mathematics for the R&D people and the technical directors. So if you do columns one, two, three, you become an R&D person which knows a, a substantial amount about production, has taken place in part in production. If you do columns um, five, four and three, you become a, an artist that's exposed to computers and has done production work with computers. And if you do columns two, three and four, then you become a technical director so that's a computer visualization animation course. So this is really the continuation of the first undergraduate degree that we've done. Yes, and I think one of the things that um, was actually an additional benefit from this is that with the group project in the second year, um, which uh, at that point took place in the computer animation production two unit, um, yeah. also then had um, students from the different streams uh, joining uh, uh, together and complementing each other's um, capabilities and knowledge to create even better group uh, animations. Um, yeah. And But that wasn't actually, and in that uh, third decade, so over the past 10 years, we also had quite a few students uh, present more of their research, more of their research at international conferences, but more on that later. Okay. Let's have a look at this. That's an example of a project which was uh, done by three different types of students. 
this case, actually, two of them, so there was no change one there. students, I think in this case from two different degree programs, but working together on their final animation. Okay. Okay. Oh. Yep. I think I need to speed this up a little bit because we're running out of time. Yes. So let's talk about the Queen's anniversary prize in a few words. Yep. Uh, basically, since 1994, uh, the Queen decided to award a prize to certain in, in the, um, educational institutions to signify uh, their contribution, if you want, uh, to the excellence of either the arts or the sciences in, the, in general. So in um, 2011, uh, the NCCA was awarded the Queen's Anniversary Prize, which is a competition you're likely to only get that once for a educational institution. So there's, that was Bournemouth's chance of getting one. Uh, so the prize was awarded for world-class computer animation teaching with a wider, wider scientific and creative applications. And here's a picture of Peter Hardy and myself holding the prize. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it was a big thing for the university. We went down, we shook hands with the, the Queen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, and yes. Yeah, so um, research then has also changed a bit. Yep. Uh, well, we have the uh, instead of the RAE, the Research Assessment Exercise, we have the Research Excellence Framework. You know, the uh, more la plus ça change. Uh, the more it changes, the more it stays the same. So in 2014, 72% of the NCCA research was ranked as four star. Now this time, four star is the highest grade you could get. And three star, very uh, considerable, either outstanding or very considerable. And they also, yeah, they seem to like us. Uh, the university was, um, I'm, well, they were pleasantly surprised because they didn't think we could make it. Uh, a while ago, we were told by an important person in the university, uh, we're not as good as we think we are. Well, we proved that we were better than we thought we, we were. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, yeah. yeah, and then there was also actually other awards. So there was one research project in the group that was awarded uh the a prize from times higher education so that's also a prestigious award yeah uh well in this case it was primarily the work of alexander valeri uh, oleg and lee mclaughlin and i was involved in that project but in a minor 
uh, role. Yes. Uh, we have a film of that, but unfortunately we can't show it. We don't have time. Yeah, and um, yes, yeah, sorry. And then again, there have been also quite a few student research projects, which I mentioned earlier, but I'll be as quick as possible. So um, we've had quite a few students uh, submit together with um, staff uh, and mainly undergraduate students to international conferences where the work has done actually very well. So quite a few of those works have gone to SIGGRAPH. Um, but not on the animation side, but this time round as research submissions, which took also uh, in part in the um, research, student research competition run by SIGGRAPH, which aims to identify the best research by a student in a given year. I mean, these two examples here did go instead to Eurographics, so the annual conference um, of the European Association for Computer Graphics, which is the largest computer graphics conference on this side of the Atlantic. And yeah, the first one was, yes, incredibly prestigious. And Tom Miner and Robert Ponslet, so two stage students, uh, they presented a method that would automatically add light pollution to night sky rendering. So things that artists would usually paint in uh, uh, into um, things or do through post-processing. Um, uh, this uh, so by actually applying the real physical simulation, this would automatically be added during the rendering process. And uh, then uh, we had two other students, George Magis and Idris Miles. Um, they presented work at Eurographics where they developed a new method for comparing different versions of the same animation sequence. So if one had one version, then one worked on it, had it created another version, but then also uh, allowed to generate merged versions. So you might find, okay, I like the way that this arm moves in this version of the animation sequence, but uh, I don't like the way that the legs move, but I have a different version where the legs move the way they want it. And it would allow them to merge these different uh, production uh, versions into a new better one. Yeah. And yes, and then we also had quite a few projects I mentioned that went to SIGGRAPH. So, one example uh, of uh, one of those that won the second place at SIGGRAPH was Quentin Corkamarin's research in 4D cubism, which was mainly supervised by Valeri and also contributed to by um, uh, Alexander Pasco. Yeah. And, and based on the work that Valeri and Pasco have been doing for years, which is uh, soft objects or, or function based representation of objects. And yep. yes, in this case, uh, allowing uh, to kind of like emulate uh, the um, uh, cubist uh, style and then apply this to um, other objects in a way automatically and make them appear cubi a cubist. Okay. And then we had um, in 2018, Bianca Serde, who created a method and tool for procedurally simulating fruit decay. So um, you would place uh, some parameters, uh, provide some parameters such as, you know, the loss of um, water uh, inside, but then it would uh, automatically take the fruit and uh, have it rot. Uh, and uh, you could directly select to which point it should be rotting. And yes, so that was done procedurally and won first place at SIGGRAPH. Mm. Yeah, quite an interesting project, this. Yes, and yes, since then she worked, has been working for double negative or DNEG as they call themselves now. And I think the last thing she did was um, uh, uh, being part of the team uh, working on Tenet. That, so the team that just won the Oscar and uh, in visual effects. And I think she also worked on the new James Bond movie. Right. Yeah, so. Hello, and welcome to this quick demo video of how to use Dave, which is a prototype for automatic environment decoration. 
The user is able to select a varying amount of props and click import selection. But for this scene, we want to use the entire scene. So we're just going to click scan scene. We'll then be given this UI element here, which will allow us to tag each object as if they are a door or a wall, which I'll quickly do. For this demo, we're only importing walls and doors. It's worth noting that if you were to import a dining table, the user has the option to either create their own hole for it or to have the tool automatically generate it. After tagging the various walls and doors at the scene, we're now being prompted to set the building identifier for each of the buildings in the scene, which I'll again do. The user has the option to tag up to 100 buildings, each with 100 rooms. The user is now prompted to set the various rooms for the buildings in the scene, with each building grouped in its own tab. After the room identifiers have been tagged, the user is then prompted to create the various floor plans for the scene. The user is also able to click focus on room, which makes it easier to determine which floor plan you are currently creating. With that done, the user is now free to click decorate scene, and the whole scene will be decorated in a matter of seconds. The results of the prototype are designed to be fast and lightweight, and as such, some minor cleanup may be required by the user. The scene used in this demo took around 4 minutes to set up and around about 20 seconds to clean up, with the actual decoration process only taking a matter of seconds. Yeah, once again, a, an interesting application of, um, uh, you know, procedural um, uh, methods. And yeah, so that was Callum, who's now working in the games industry for the Creative Assembly and who was a member of the final cohort of the CVA undergraduate program. Yeah. Because around that, at that time, um, so like you now only just a few years ago, um, uh, there were quite a few marketing driven changes to um, our courses. So some of the existing programs were renamed. So the computer visualization and animation was replaced by a similar computer animation technical arts program. And the computer animation arts course was uh, replaced by a very similar computer animation art and design course. A visual effects course has been added and Yes, because there were not enough students recruited to, uh, to this course, making it um, financially non-viable. Unfortunately, software development for animation games and effects was discontinued. And that is kind of where we are now. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, right, you want me to sort of conclude by uh, summing up well, Peter Hardy and I were very young and dumb, didn't realize how hard it would be to create and sustain the National Center for 30 years, but I'm glad we did anyway. <laughs> I'm glad too, because otherwise I would not be where I am now. <laughs> okay. So, okay. I mean, do you, yeah. If anyone, we do have a, I'm not sure how, I don't have a, clock here or time oh yeah we are a bit over time aren't we <laughs> yeah, we're it's... running a bit over time by about 35 minutes already <laughs> but that's fine i think okay. that's fine does anyone have any questions what? i have a question um about technology um i was wondering because there's been such a progress in terms of what computer animation can do and also the underlying techniques. You mentioned the navigation from Seagull to Maya. And um, how do you keep um, pace with um, all these technological developments throughout the years? How do you um, have this vibrant discussion between industry and yeah, technological development? Well, some of us do research, which means we stay ahead in our, well, at, at least we stay abreast of developments in our field. Others attend uh, conferences or attend uh, seminars uh, or produce work themselves. I mean, uh, for an artist to stay current, they must um, practice what they teach uh, by producing animation, still works, etc., by exhibiting. Uh, for a scientist to stay abreast, they must uh, do research, publish papers, attend conferences, etc. 
So it's like any other academic discipline, really. You have to, to stay ahead. You have to run as fast as you can. Actually, to stay st stand still, you must run as fast as you can. Yeah, and I think one thing that one also needs to realize is that not everything can be covered. So part of it is also then, you know, yeah. um, of the academic work is synthesizing the important principles that uh, are generally applicable. Uh, so they can be, um, uh, so if someone is missing maths classes with you in the chat. <laughs> you, can, you can summarize it as follows. An undergraduate degree, a good undergraduate degree should teach you not stuff, but teach you how to learn. Mm. And then you spend the rest of your life learning if you're uh, <laughs> to be a successful yeah, practitioner you know, in anything. It's, it's, you know, being given the, uh, you know, it's like, you know, a boost up or onto a wall, but the climbing you need to do yourself. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, it, it's probably at odds with uh, the current philosophy of many universities, but the principle is teach them how to learn. And that's the best um, thing you can do for the students. It's basically saying, uh, give a poor man a fish, it'll live, eat for a day, teach them how to fish, they'll eat for life. <laughs> Thank you. All right, if, you, if there are no other questions and we still have some time, you can play the NCCA uh, history anime uh, yeah, video, which I think if, Saf if was- nobody has questions. Yeah. Could I ask a question? Yes, sure. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on what the future of the NCCA could look like, or where you want it to go? Well, Peter is retired now, so I think <laughs> he yep. is fairly ambivalent on that. Well, uh, um, I I would hope that um, uh, you know some of the things that have recently been. Uh, lost for various reasons. So for example, the technical uh, or more the, com uh, the software development course was um, retired because there were not enough students there. I think um, this is a loss and I would hope that we get something like this back because while it's uh, there were not enough students, it is clearly something that uh, the industry wants. So all of the students, uh, um, almost all of the students who um, uh, left went into industry and doing a lot of the R&D jobs there now. Um, so that um, is, so that course was a loss. Then again, there's also other areas where uh, new courses might be useful. So I know that they are now starting a new undergraduate degree here um, or looking at um, virtual reality. So that might be um, something which has a future potential. And then perhaps also looking at other application areas um, of this, so uh, of the same techniques uh, and technologies. So personally, I'm quite involved in um, the visualization of cultural heritage. And I think there might be something that could happen at the National Center for Computer Animation. Thank you very much. And thank you for the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye. Bye.